seem to fire up on all cylinders. And it looks like we are just getting booted up on Facebook, on Twitter, Periscope, and over on YouTube. Let's make sure that the stream is coming through loud and clear. And it looks like we're live. There we are. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a criminal defense attorney here at the r, r Law Group. My team and I, over the course of many years, we've helped literally thousands of people facing criminal charges navigate the criminal justice system. And over the course of those years, we've seen a lot of problems with that justice system. In particular, we're talking about issues with the police, problems with the prosecutors, judicial misconduct, political misconduct. We've seen a lot of gross behavior from politicians and basically anybody who's involved in that system. You know, there, there are issues with that. We are only human and, and people are, in, are fallible. So what we want to do is call that out. We want to hold them accountable to the same standard that you or I would be held to were we going through the justice system. We want to make sure that those police and those prosecutors and those judges and those politicians are all being held to the same standard. And so watching the watchers is a show to that end. We want to follow along throughout the judicial process, throughout our political process, and make sure that these people are being held accountable. Now, Traditionally, we cover, you know, some of the police shootings, some of the prosecutorial misconduct cases, judicial misconduct cases. But this week, it's only Amy Coney Barrett. That's all we've been talking about. That is truly the only real legal issue that is on anybody's mind right now. If you go to any news station, any news news coverage, you're going to see a lot about the Senate confirmation hearings. And like you, many of us in this in this space are a little bit tired of these. Uh, Senate confirmation hearings, by my mind, are predominantly just a political spectacle. It's an opportunity for the senators to just pontificate about Lord knows what, something that's going to make them feel good about uh, about them being a senator and something that they think is going to be impactful to their constituents back home. But that's it, right? It doesn't really serve much other than that, other than them just having kind of a field day. Now, we do want to know a little bit more about Amy Coney Barrett. I've talked about it ad nauseum on this channel, what a pivotal moment this is for the court. Many people don't, I think, realize the significance of exactly what it is we're dealing with. But, you know, this is a, a shift in the court's uh, ideology that is going to be lasting, very long lasting. Unless the Democrats decide that they want to pack the court, this could have an impact that the country feels for the next 30, 40, 50 years. So it is a moment that we want to document. We want to make sure that we're covering it. We're doing you know, a thorough, in-depth, deep dive analysis because this is one of, a once in a lifetime opportunity and we're grateful that you're here and joining us for the conversation. As a reminder, if you're not a regular subscriber to this channel, hit that subscribe button because uh, there's a lot to talk about and we cover it here. So let's dive into the hearing. So just some general thoughts. I thought that this hearing today, the, the actual questions today were better. I thought that there was some more interesting uh, you know, light back and forth between Amy Coney Barrett and the various senators. It was a little bit more lively. She was a little bit more irritable today tired of answering the same questions over and over. We learn a little bit more about her. We know that she uh, drinks wine. We know, actually, we saw that she actually wrote a note down today. So she took a pen and actually wrote something down today. So we'll dive into that when we get through it. But uh, by and large, it was the same feel. The senators would take their 20 minutes asking questions or not asking questions, rather just sort of lecturing about Lord knows what. And then Amy Coney Barrett would respond. Now, uh, I watched most of the hearing. There were parts where I would skip through where people were just not asking questions, where the senators would just talk for 20 minutes. I don't need to hear their speeches. So we would just kind of clip through and see what they were asking and what Amy Coney Barrett had to say in response. So we have a lot of clips from a lot of the different senators. So it's going to be a clip heavy show. I apologize in advance, but most of these clips I think are, are interesting. We can see how this is working and we can see this little dance that is taking place. You know, a lot of people don't recognize sort of what a highly kind of a beautiful choreographed political display, what a spectacle this whole thing is. Everybody in this room already knows what the outcome is. All the senators know what the outcome is. Amy Coney Barrett knows what the outcome is, uh, or, or, or at least is confident that she knows what the outcome is. She, you know, she would have known if she butchered a question or really botched something that she would have been disqualified. But she's a woman who is obviously so highly confident in her legal capabilities that she knew that that was not going to happen. She knew that she could walk right in here, have no issue with any of these questions, 
And she's proven that. She's proven after today that really she does not get rattled at all. Uh, we've got a little cliffs where she gets a little bit, you know, kind of irritable, but that's it. By and large, she's unflappable, cannot be flapped, which is, you know, a quality you want in a judge. So we're going to go through some of the clips today. We're going to start uh, Lindsey Graham, who is the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He did his usual shtick. Uh, I, I covered this yesterday. I'm not going to go into it again. He does this, aw shucks, you know, look at me. I'm just this, um, you know, very simple Southerner explain stuff to me, but he, he kind of goes through and he treats it like a prosecutor. Anyways, nothing really particular that I wanted to cover there. The first case or the first situation I wanted to review was when Senator Dianne Feinstein, who's the Senate minority leader for the Judiciary Committee, she asks Amy Coney Barrett a question and she is specifically talking about severability and the Obamacare Act. So as a quick refresher, there is a case that is going to be heard in front of the Supreme Court the week after the election, and it's going to be about Obamacare. In particular, it's about this idea of severability. If Obamacare no longer has a tax because of the Trump tax codes, if there's no longer a penalty because that that penalty has been zeroed out by Congress under the Trump administration, then can that Affordable Care Act still exist? If there's no teeth behind the bill, does the bill stand? That's what the Supreme Court is going to decide. And so this is what Sen uh, Senator Feinstein is asking Amy Coney so Barrett about. So can you about. explain to us today how you would disagree or agree with Justice Scalia's view of severability in that NFIB, uh, National Federation of Independent Business case? And as a quick reminder, uh, throughout this entirety of the show, all of these clips are going to be sped up. Their eyes are either about 1.75 speed or two speed. So just get used to that. Uh, I, it's really hard to listen to these people talk at regular speed because it's so slow. And so it may sound a little bit like a chipmunk right now, but you'll get used to it uh, as we go through here. And it's a much better way to actually listen to it. So I apologize if it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's, it's so that we can get through a lot of material here. We got a lot to cover. What I, I think I can say without expressing disagreement or agreement for the reasons I said yesterday, not being able to grade precedents, um, the severability issue, first of all, the majority holding, as you recognized, was that even though the Medicaid provision was unconstitutional, it was severable. So Justice Scalia expressed his view in dissent. Um, even by Justice Scalia's view, the issue would be different in California versus Texas um, for two reasons. One, Justice Scalia thought two provisions of the Constitution were unconstitutional. So if you picture severability being like a Jenga game, it's kind of if you pull one out, can you pull it out while it all stands? Or if you pull two out, will it still stand? So Justice Scalia, his view was that if you pulled those two provisions out, could it still stand? And here we're talking about one. And also, Congress has amended the statute since NFIB versus Sebelius, and it's zeroed out the mandate. So now, I mean, California versus Texas involves a different provision because of the zeroing out um, that was done by amendment. So that's how the two cases. Okay, watch Feinstein. What do you think of all that? What do I think of? Yeah. So that um, answer went way over her head. Or in that instance. I think the doctrine of severability, as it's been described by the court, you know, serves a valuable function of trying not to undo your work when you wouldn't want a court to undo your work. Um, severability strives to look at a statute as a whole and say, would Congress have considered this provision so vital that kind of in the Jenga game, pulling it out, Congress wouldn't want the statute anymore. So it, it's designed now listen to, to what she says. Intent. But, you know, severability is designed to say, well, would Congress still want the statute to stand even with this provision gone? Would Congress have still passed the same statute without it? So I think insofar as it tries to effectuate what Congress would have wanted, it's the court and Congress working hand in hand. Thank you. That's quite a definition. I'm, I'm really impressed. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is impressive, right? And that's the whole point. That's why I wanted to play that clip. So the substance of what Amy Coney Barrett is saying is not that, that important. Unless you are somebody who uh, lives in the legal world, what you're going to hear throughout these hear hearings is mostly just legalese. It's a lot of legal talk. So unless you know the cases or you know these concepts of severability or how the process works, it's going to sound like a foreign language by and large. But what 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 it happened right here is Feinstein asks her a question. She hits it right out of the park. She says, oh yeah, severability. Let me tell you everything that ever was written in, in about two seconds about severability, condenses it down in this beautiful little sound clip gives it back to her and she doesn't even know what to do with it. And you, you've been in conversations like that with people, right? Or you've interviewed people and they'll go off, they'll give you this beautiful answer and you'll just say, well, okay, well, what do you, uh, what do you, <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, pretty good because you don't have a follow-up. You don't know how to, how to ask a follow-up question because they just hit it out of the park. So that's what Senator Diane Feinstein does says, well, what do you think about that? And then she goes on and says, well, severability is important. The reason it's important is so that we can actually, effectuate the intent of the statute that Congress that you passed, Senator Dianne Feinstein. And so she's basically saying, yeah, I mean, severability is good because it effectuates your own intent. And that, you know, I don't think Senator Dianne Feinstein was, was looking for that as an answer. I think that she was bringing this question up to 
really sort of impugn her on the Affordable Care Act by indicating that she wanted somehow to just sever the whole thing and eliminate the bill in its entirety. And she didn't get that answer. And she also agrees. I mean, it was a, kind of a funny clip. Senator Dianne Feinstein says it's a hell of an answer. Pretty, pretty dang impressive. And she's right. It was pretty impressive. So, uh, you know, so that was that was good. Right. A, a fair, good question from a senator, a Democratic senator and a very substantive actual response. And the question was received well by the Democratic senator. So this is how the lines of questioning should go. Unfortunately, a lot of these senators didn't do that. A lot of them just took 20, 30 minutes to rifle off about Lord knows what. And so uh, we're not going to get into the, you know, I'm not going to play clips of them going on their tirades, but there was a lot of that today on both sides. Uh, both the Democrats and the Republicans did it for very different reasons. All right. So the next senator who was up, actually, we skip a couple, but we're, we're not going to cover every one of them. But the next one who was up was uh, Patrick Leahy from Vermont. And he does we go back to you remember we talked about this yesterday uh this 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 use of images we talked about themes we talked about you know how the democratic party gets on a theme or a set of themes and they just beat that drum consistently they're very good at it and so we talked yesterday about them in, in bringing up these images holding up the poster boards showing these graphics and these visuals of people who are going to be hurt if Amy Coney Barrett is put on the court, according to them, if she goes on the court and she starts overturning all of these other cases, which, you know, is, is up for debate, obviously, if she did that, then they're saying, well, look at all these poor people, look at all, uh, all these people who are going to die from whatever it is, you know, look at all the people who are going to be disenfranchised, look at all the racism that's going to come roaring back. And so that kind of shtick just was, uh, was continued on today, and in large part by Senator Leahy. Now, there are a couple clips from his questioning that we wanted to talk about. And uh, we go through this initial question where he, he actually starts going through some legal precedent with her. It's a little bit hard to hear these clips, but she actually corrects him. So she calls him out and says, no, nah, the way you characterized that, that dissent or that opinion is just not accurate. And so she kind of, you know, sets him straight a little bit, which was sort of the beginning of her today where she's getting a little bit, you know, like a little bit kind of pushing back a little bit more than we saw yesterday. Um, Senator Leahy, I just wanted to make one correction. King versus Burwell wasn't a case about whether the uh, Affordable Care Act was constitutional or not. That one was purely a question of statutory interpretation. So just to make clear about that. Um, I would say that you did pray. I, I, I did. I did. In a radio okay. interview, I said that I thought the dissent had the better of the statutory interpretation argument. Um, I have a couple of things, I guess, that maybe might help shed some light on this question. Um, one is that, of course, in both of those contexts, I was speaking as an academic. And as I mentioned yesterday, an academic uh, serves a very different function than a judge. So an academic doesn't go through the judicial process, doesn't hear the case or controversy, have the litigants and the briefs and the consultation with colleagues, the writing yeah, of we, an opinion. We, we all understand that, but that's not my question. My question was, did you ever write or speak out in defense of the ACA, whether as a uh, academic or as a, as a member of the judiciary? That's a pretty simple question. No. Answer, yes or no? Um, no, I've never had occasion to speak on a policy question. And so every time you waited on it, you said the law is unconstitutional. Now, no. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. so they have a lot of these problems actually today. There are some audio problems that we're gonna we're gonna see. So you know, this some of these senators are still appearing on Zoom, and actually Senator Ted Cruz and Dick Durbin. I have a clip from them. They kind of get into what you know why that may be. But there is there is sort of an absence. Kamala Harris is actually appearing by Zoom. We have a clip from her, two clips from her, and Leahy is also appearing by Zoom, and it makes it difficult for them to actually answer questions. So I think it undermines their effectiveness, quite frankly. You saw there that they were kind of talking over one another. There was an issue yesterday with Leahy's voice. So sort of a sort of a, an ineffective way to, I think, conduct these hearings. And you, you can sort of see there, right? They're sort of talking over each and, other. Uh, it just didn't work out very well. Uh, we have another clip here. So he, this, is, this is also from Leahy. So yeah, he actually does have some good questions. And this one is about whether the Supreme Court has the final word. And the reason why I wanted to highlight this clip is because we've talked about this a lot on this channel, in particular about the, the issue of the court's legitimacy. We, when we think back back to our constitutional law class for me or our civics class or social studies class. One of the things that is fundamental to how the American country, how, how our democracy works, how our republic works is we have these three branches of government and there's they're separate but equal. They have checks and balances. You've got the executive branch, the legislative branch and the judicial branch. And when you when you are really familiar with how the judicial branch works, you understand that they don't have any real enforcement mechanisms. So they don't have the authority to say, we passed this ruling and therefore we're going to go enforce it. 
So they could say, yep, we're going to uphold Roe versus Wade. And if you don't, if you disagree with that and your state bans it, the Supreme Court, the judiciary, that entire branch of government doesn't have an enforcement agency. There's, they, don't, they don't have police officers who are going to go and you know, go to individual states and enforce these things. All of that is left over to the executive branch, which is the enforcer of the laws. So Congress writes the laws, the executive enforces the laws, and the judge judiciary makes sure that they're valid. So what Amy Coney Barrett is talking about here is that specifically, that the court doesn't have any enforcement mechanism. And Patrick Leahy asks her about it. She answers, I think, quite brilliantly. But the issue, the reason why I wanted to highlight this is because we talk a lot about this in the context of court packing and the court's legitimacy. So there are two things that we need to consider. Right now, or, or prior to Justice Ginsburg passing away, the court had a five to four balance, five conservative judges with Judge Roberts technically being a conservative judge. And then we had the four liberal judges. Well, now it's a four, four and, or, or a, a, a it's really a 5-3, and if Amy Coney Barrett is on, it's going to be a 6-3. Again, presuming that Justice Roberts is a conservative judge, which many people would disagree with that. So if you if you you know put them in that category, we have a 6-3 court. Now there is a large portion of the United States population that's going to say that is an illegitimate court. It just is. It's a conservative court. We've already seen a lot of the Democrats talking about the Republicans are packing the court. They've redefined that word to say that what's happening here with Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation process is packing the court. We've heard Joe Biden say, I'm not a fan of packing the court. We've heard it from a lot of the different senators. We've covered it here on this channel as well. They're using this term. They're redefining it in a way that supports their, their narrative. And so what we're talking about here is whether whether this is going to keep the court legitimate, right? Is a 6-3 court going to remain legitimate? The, con the contrast of that or the alternative would be what happens if Amy Coney Barrett is appointed, now we have a 6-3 court, and the Democrats come back and they make it, instead of a nine-person court, a 13-person court or a 15-person court? What happens if they appoint four additional judges to the nine that we already have, making it 13? That would swing the balance of power back towards the left, but what would that do for the court's legitimacy? In other words, what would happen if, that, if they did that if the Democrats packed the court and the, the Republicans regained control of the White House at some point in the future or of Congress at some point in the future and they passed a law or they passed something and then they enforced the law and then the Supreme Court struck it down, what would happen? What would happen if the Republicans just said, you know what, we think that you're, the entire judiciary is illegitimate because the court has been packed, because you added on those four additional judges. They, think, they say they're illegit illegitimate. There's no legitimacy anymore. So we're not going to follow the rules of the judiciary. What could the judiciary do? Nothing. That's the whole point. They can't. They have to be, their power comes from their legitimacy. And the check is the people that you and I, the people who are observing what's happening, saying, yeah, we support the court. Look, we trust these nine people to make decisions. We give them all of this power. We give them all of this responsibility. And we're going to trust and follow what they say because we've made that agreement. Otherwise, there is no enforcement mechanism. So this is why this is such an important concept, and it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. But let's get into Amy Coney Barrett's response to the question that Senator Patrick Leahy asks. Is the Supreme Court's word is final, or is the Supreme Court's word only final as far as the lower courts are concerned? Um, Senator Leahy, I'm glad to have the opportunity to clarify from our conversation. First, I know that both Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh said that no man is above the law, and I agree with that. But I conversed with Senator Lee yesterday about Federalist 78, which says that courts have neither force nor will. In other words, we can't do anything to enforce our own judgments. And so what I meant in the conversation with you is that as a matter of law, the Supreme Court may have the final word. The Supreme Court lacks control over what happens after that. The Supreme Court in any federal court has no power, no force, and no will. So it relies on the other branches to react to its judgments accordingly. I remember the young law student. Right. And that's why it needs to remain legitimate. That's why it's so important. And, and many people had this position when Judge Roberts actually sided with the liberals and upheld the Affordable Care Act because they were saying that he was so concerned about the court's legitimacy. Here we had Barack Obama just got elected. We had this blue wave. They had control of the Senate and the House and the country was really rallying behind this new administration. So Justice Roberts, the story goes, was sitting there looking at this and saying, all right, well, great. We have this, you know, the country is resoundingly in favor of this administration and, and this agenda. So if the first act 
that this president gets passed through, President Barack Obama, the first domestic major policy of achievement of his administration, if the court just turned around and struck it down, Judge Roberts is thinking that is going to wreck the credibility and the legitimacy of the court, and therefore he didn't do it. So that's why he sort of you know maneuvered around to come up with this in my mind, a ridiculous idea that it's a tax uh, rather than a penalty. And uh, I think it was bad case law. I can go into that separately. But uh, Amy Coney Barrett is talking about it, and I think she's she's spot on that they really don't have an enforcement mechanism, which indicates to me that she's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty also, you know, she's, she's aware and concerned about the court's legitimacy, and which is a valid concern at this point with all the talk of the court packing going on. All right. So the next clip also comes. No, this comes from it's from the litigants. Dick Durbin. Let's take a look at this one. I guess what troubles me is this. You style yourself an originalist, textualist, factualist, whatever the term. All right, so let me back up on this. So uh, Dick Durbin is now going to ask her sort of the same, some of the same questions that uh, they asked yesterday. And they play this game a lot. So she's, he, he's going to get into this question of originalism. And originalism as a refresher is this idea that you just look at the text and you read the text, you analyze it, and you interpret it, uh, uh, you apply it to the facts that are in front of you. So it's you know, the, the text of the law, the facts, you review them both, and you come up with a conclusion. So he's going to use this originalism concept against Amy Coney Barrett. He's going to say, look, you're an originalist, right? Should be pretty easy for you to take a look at some language and give me a thumbs up or thumbs down on it, right? And then he's going to ask her a series of questions. So that is just the lead up to what we're going to see. I guess what troubles me is this. You style yourself an originalist, textualist, factualist, whatever the term is, which means you go right to the words and try to understand the words and their original meaning. And so if I change Senator Feinstein's question and didn't ask you whether the president has the authority to unilaterally delay a general election, ask you instead, does the president have the authority to unilaterally deny the right to vote to any person based on their race? What would your answer be? Well, Senator, obviously there are many laws in effect, including the Equal Protection Clause, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, including the 15th Amendment, which protects the right to vote against discrimination based on race. And so there's a principle in constitutional law called external constraints. And even if one evaluates what the authority a branch might have to act, there are external, uh, external constraints that press in from other parts of the Constitution. Here, it would be the 14th and 15th, uh, 15th Amendments. Well, of course it would. The 15th Amendment, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race. For an originalist and a textualist, that is clear text as I see it. But when asked whether or not the president has any authority to unilaterally deny that right to vote for a person based on race or even gender, are you saying you can't answer that question? Senator, I just referenced the 14th and 15th Amendments, the same one that you just repeated back to me, that do prohibit discrimination on the basis of race in voting. So I, as I said, I don't know how else I can say it, the Constitution contains provisions that prohibit discrimination on the basis of race in voting. But whether a president can unilaterally deny, you're not going to answer yeah, your question. Well, Senator, you've asked a couple different questions about what the, senator, uh, what the president might be able to unilaterally do, and I think that I really can't say anything more than I'm not going to answer hypotheticals. Yeah, so, you know, it's just, it's the same shtick. We, we're, we're, we're getting pretty used to this, right? We saw that, we've seen this with Trump many, many times. We see this with, with different politicians all over the place. Basically, what they want is them to start, you know, this call and response type of routine. You know, I'm just going to ask you a very simple question. We're going to see Cory Booker does it too. All of these different Democratic senators, it's this theme. Listen, I know you're a judge. I know you're going to be on the Supreme Court. But look, can we just talk as people? We just talk as human beings like you agree, right? Racism's bad. Can you just say so? And so she gives her technical legal answer and he he doesn't like it, even though she did respond to the question. She said, yeah, the 14th, 14th, 14th 15th Amendment, those all reconstruction amendments, no slavery. I'm not a racist. All, OK, and he doesn't like that answer. So he presses her again. And we're, this is just a pattern. We're going to see a lot of this as we go through these hearings. He gets into a. a another a, another quote where he follow he follows up that question he says sort of that's uh that's kind of a strange con concept of originalism he, he doesn't want to let go on this one so on uh, this next clip he, he gets back into it it strains originalism if the clear wording of the constitution establishes a right and you will not acknowledge it well senator it would strain the canons of conduct which don't permit me to offer off-the-cuff reactions or any opinions outside of the judicial decision making process it would strain article three which prevents me from deciding legal issues outside the context of cases and controversies and as justice ginsburg said it would display disregard for the whole judicial process so then let's take it to and so she just hits that one right out of the park well it kind of strains originalism right and she goes well it strains the constitution article three cases and controversies and she just goes off and rattles all three of the reasons why uh, she can't actually answer those questions. And so, you know, you, you watch those and you're just like, all right, you know, these people are, I think, outclassed in almost every, in every way. Now, they're valid questions and I understand what they're trying to do, but this is why I'm, I'm explaining that this is all just a shtick. 
De Senator Dick Durbin knows that she can't answer those questions, knows that she's not going to, but is still posing them because he's trying to, you know, to, to coax out of her, trying to seize on something, but she just won't let him have it. So this continues on. We're just kind of getting warmed up here. We have Senator Whitehouse, no clips from him because he goes back on his little, uh, uh, conspiracy theory diagram chart deal. So we, we remember yesterday he was, he had that, that red Sharpie and he was just drawing all of these arrows all of the you know, all connecting all of the different dots. And in particular, he was talking about money and the Federalist Society and all of this secret dark money that's pouring in to change the judiciary of America. So he comes back out today and he's got more little diagrams. So over here, he's talking about this case called Abood, and he talks about this slow progression of sort of reversing the precedent or overruling the case. So he's saying that the Supreme Court really wants to overturn Abood, but it was precedent. And so they had to go through this slow series of other cases that rolled back some of the protections of Abood before they could finally declare that Abood should be overruled. So it's just kind of this slow progression. It starts with Knox, we go to Harris and so on and so forth. Then it gets over, you know, each one of these is sort of the building block for the justification for overturning the entire case. So he goes on that little thing, and we hear again about that from uh, Senator Hirono. Then he brings up this, again, the $45 million money trail behind Janice. So he's saying that all of this uh, was a precursor, and you know all of these big organizations spent a ton of money to overturn that. That all had to do with uh, union rights and things like that. So, uh, you know, again, I, not particularly effective in my mind. I don't know how any of that information has anything to do with Amy Coney Barrett. It doesn't. She wasn't on the court. She didn't decide any of those other cases. Uh, as far as I know, she's not affiliated with any of the groups that uh, Sheldon Whitehouse was mentioning there on that chart. So I don't I don't know what he was getting at. He did ask an interesting question uh, that, that, I, that I didn't know, and actually Amy Coney Barrett didn't know, was about this concept that the Supreme Court actually has lesser disclosure requirements than some of the other agencies. So Senator Whitehouse actually told Amy Coney Barrett that, you, hey, do you know, by the way, that if you're on the Supreme Court, that you actually have less disclosure requirements than we do as senators? And she said, no, I didn't know that. Uh, she said, I, I figured it would be sort of the same thing as the federal circuit courts, you know, the court that she's currently sitting on. She thought it would be the same disclosure requirements. Everybody gets to see her, you know, financial statements and all that stuff. It's, you know, a matter of transparency. So he says, no, it's actually lesser on the Supreme Court. And she didn't know that kind of an interesting exchange, but uh, turns out she's going to comply with all of the requirements as you would expect. So then we go on over to Senator Ted Cruz and Ted Cruz, again, almost, you know, nothing really fiery in terms of questions. I, I sort of skip through his stuff because he just likes to talk a lot. But at the very beginning of his uh, actual time for questioning, he gets into it a little bit with Senator Dick Durbin and he has a good point. He basically is saying, hey, this thing's in the can, folks. We already know how this is going to roll out. We, you know, the Democrats know how this thing is going to play. Republicans know how this is going to play. And he congratulates Amy Coney Barrett and says, hey, good news. You're going to the Supreme Court. And uh, it was kind of an interesting exchange uh, because Senator uh, Dick Durbin didn't like how he characterized some of his colleagues' absence. Let's take a look. Uh, let me say, first of all, the last three days of hearings have revealed very good news. Uh, they have revealed the news that Judge Barrett is going to be confirmed by this committee and by the full Senate. With two full days of questioning, we've seen that our Democratic colleagues have very few questions actually to raise about Judge Barrett's qualifications. Very little of the time we've spent in here has concerned her record as a judge, her 20 years as, an, as a respected scholar. Instead, much of this hearing has focused on political attacks directed at President Trump. Um, I recognize our Democratic colleagues are not going to be voting for President Trump in November. That's certainly their prerogative. Uh, but they've largely abandoned even trying to make the case that Judge Barrett is anything other than exceptionally well qualified uh, to serve as a justice. It is striking that as we sit here right now in this committee room, there are only two Democratic senators in the room. If you look at the dais, there's chair after chair after chair that is empty. The Democratic senators are no longer even attending. That's when they'll show up for their time. But it is indicative of what they're tacitly admitting, which is that they don't have substantive criticism. Mr. Chairman, may I make a point of personal privilege? Of course. We're in the midst of a COVID-19 crisis, a pandemic, and some members are in their offices following this on television, and to suggest their absence here means they're not following or participating is incorrect. I would note the senator from Illinois and his personal privilege somehow omitted the fact that, that all but two of the Democrats were physically here yesterday, and after the questioning, they made the decision not to be here. That's fine. That, you're welcome to make that decision. But it's indicative, when it comes to the time of the questioning, that this side of the aisle does not have arguments against Judge Barrett to have any chance of prevailing. Oh, Ted Cruz is so funny. 
he just got that little grin. You know, he had that whole thing set up. He was waiting for one of those senators to say, yeah, we're in the middle of a coronavirus crisis. And he just says, that's funny. Well, why were they all here yesterday then? Hmm. Very peculiar. Very interesting. So he's very good at getting those digs in. Uh, it's hysterical. It actually makes me <laughs> uh, want to laugh hysterically, because. Uh, but I got to stay focused and stay on point. All right. So Senator Ted Cruz, you know, has that little jab at Dick Durbin. Uh, the rest of his stuff is a lot of, you know, kind of folksy back and forth with Amy Coney Barrett. So not a lot there. We move over to Senator Klobuchar. You may remember her from the Senate or the Democratic primary that we just feels like we just got over that. Uh, and so she is also questioning Judge Barrett. Uh, I wanted to show you before we get into that, that uh, as she's asking a question, this is the first time in the entire de entire confirmation hearing that uh, we actually see Judge Amy Coney Barrett pick up her pen and write a little note. So Amy Klobuchar is the one who, who prompted that. It's the first time I saw it, she may have done it previously, but let's take a watch. The five four and known as very Watch conservative the when you look back through history to six three, six three, and that would have great repercussion. Boom, put it down. So she just writes a little bit of a note there, and uh, you know didn't like something that she heard. So then we go over to the actual clip from Amy Klobuchar, and they're talking about the Affordable Care Act. So this is something that again, this is one of the themes that the Democrats had, uh, really you know really pushing that fear that if Amy Coney Barrett is appointed, that somehow the Affordable Care Act is going to be demolished, which is going to result in a you know 20 million uh, uninsured people suddenly, and that they're all going to die. So uh, they 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 really, really hammered this home these last three days. And they actually brought up a tweet from the president. So they, uh, if, when we clip over here, you're going to see Amy Klobuchar has one of the presidential tweets, you know, printed out on a board. It's right up behind her. And she is going to be asking uh, Amy about that. There have literally been hundreds of statements by him, by my colleagues. And I just find it hard to understand that you were not aware of the president's statements. Um, I am aware that the president opposes the Affordable Care Act. I'm aware that he has criticized the Affordable Care Act. I took Senator Harris's question yesterday to be referring to a specific tweet, maybe the one that you have behind you, about how he wanted to put a justice on the court to replace Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely aware of that tweet now. Um, and as I said to Senator Harris yesterday, it came up in some of my calls with Democratic senators, um, brought it up. But I honestly can't remember whether I knew about it before I was nominated or not. I don't, I'm not sure. But you, did you have then a general understanding that one of the president's campaign promises was to repeal the Affordable Care Act when you were nominated? Um, I, as I said before, I'm aware that the president opposes the Affordable Care Act. Well, I know you're aware now, but were you aware back then? Well, seems when you were nominated. Well, Senator Klobuchar, I think that the Republicans have kind of made that clear. It's just been part of the public discourse. Okay, but it just it, is the answer yes then. That you well, Senator Klobuchar, all these questions you're, you're suggesting that I have animus or that I cut a deal with the president, and I was very clear yesterday that that isn't what happened. Ooh, yeah. So she's pushing back on that, which is great. Finally, right? Uh, it's been two days. This happened. It looks like this was at 939 a.m. Pacific time. So that would have been right after the afternoon back then. It's about 1230. So I think this was the first line of questioning that took place after lunch. So she's already spent two days uh, basically getting hit on this Affordable Care Act stuff. She finally says, look, there's no deal. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not playing into this game. And she fires back at Klobuchar. Now, Klobuchar, you know, she's She's not particularly effective in this line, I think, in this role. Uh, she's aggressive. She's very, very, uh, you know, direct with these questions. And you can almost see her frustration. You can see her sort of just flailing around when she starts asking, you know, responding, saying, yeah, I've already answered that. Uh, you know, yeah, the Republicans talked about the Affordable Care Act. I know that they're opposing the, the entire concept of the bill. They have been doing it forever since it was first proposed as a bill. We've been talking about opposing the Affordable Care Act for half the country has for since 2008 or whenever since it was first proposed i mean this is this is common knowledge of course but what amy klobuchar is trying to do is to connect her saying that some sort of quid pro quo trump is going to nominate her in exchange for her being the death vote for the obamacare affordable care act and so as soon as amy coney barrett starts pushing back senator klobuchar just sort of you know she can see she's sort of just frustrated and doesn't like it which is not a particularly good look i think there's a different demeanor that is more effective all right so enough of that we will go over to ben sass and he actually talks about this idea of a being a judge versus a senator and it's a nice it's sort of a nice conversation you know i actually like these questions because we get to know more about the judge and so he is asking her uh, I think it's in this clip where he's talking about what do you, you know, what, what would the success, what would success look like if you are confirmed as a judge? If you are confirmed, uh, 
30 or 40 years from now when you hang up your robe and sit on a front porch in South Bend or wherever, probably with a big gaggle of grandkids around you, um, how will you judge whether or not you had a successful career as a judge in justice? Um, I would judge whether I'd had a successful career by whether I'd always acted with integrity, whether I'd always followed the rule of law and resisted the temptation to twist the law in the direction that I wanted it to go, whether I had treated my colleagues kindly and with collegiality, whether I had mentored and um, mentored, helped, and had good relationships with my clerks and any assistants or staff um, that I had, because both the law and the people are important. And how, how would that differ from how a senator should look back on her or his career after hopefully not 30 or 40 years, but in my view, uh, 12 <laughs> would be a good limit. But how should senators look back on their career and how does it differ from judges? Well, let's see. So I probably can't say how a senator himself or herself would, but I'll say as a citizen how I might evaluate a senator's career at the end of it. And that would be to say, did he pursue a good policy? Did he you know, sponsor legislation or vote for legislation that uh, advanced the cause of the common good in the United States? So I yeah, rock solid answer on that. So and it gave her the opportunity. He just teed her up to dis, you know, basically distinguish between what a senator does and what a judge does. Judge supposed to act with integrity, follow the rule of law, don't get twisted, don't let your personal uh, you know bias pull you one way or the other. And a senator is different. A senator is a whole different role. And so Ben Sass just kind of set her up to knock that one out of the park. Uh, and I like I like those answers because uh, I like those questions because you can see them sort of, you know, see how they think. And she's obviously thought of that question. She knew she was going to get it. And she just had her four bullet points ready to go. Uh, you know, act, well, everything you just heard it, but, you know, very, very well thought out. I think a good answer. And she was able to distinguish that quickly from the life of a senator. Now, another interesting part here. So then Ben Sass, right after that clip, he gives her a little pop quiz and she doesn't do so hot on it. So he actually says, uh, what are the five different freedoms that are protected by the First Amendment? And as I was listening to this, I was like, Oh, shoot. <laughs> I was thinking back to my my uh, constitutional law days thinking, going, oh, shoot, uh, can I name these? And I was trying to to rifle, uh, you know, to fire them off uh, as she was also firing them off. And we both missed the last one. So here is what she has to say. And the reason why is because it's like we don't we don't spend almost any time in it in law school. It's not an excuse for her. I think she should know the answer to that. If there are if there are, you know, five that somebody is asking for. And and the other the other thing is, you know, this is kind of a weird question, right? You, you're typically not asked to um, make that analysis and just sort of recite facts of the law. Like it's not, the law is not like an anatomy class. Like what is this bone? What is this bone? What is this? You know, what is, you know, how do you define, it's not a fact-based thing. It's a lot more about analysis. And so if you had a first amendment issue, you would go through a first amendment analysis and you, and there's a, I mean, there's, books and books on case law on how that analysis works. So when you get a question like, well, what are the five here? Or what are the two there? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of come up with an answer to that. Now, that being said, this is a Supreme Court judge, right? So if there are five things, she should be able to just pull five. She should be able to pull 15 out of the First Amendment. And so she gets a little bit tripped up here. She is put on the spot. So we'll give her a little bit of, a, of leeway there. But uh, an, an interesting clip nonetheless. And I want to play it so nobody says that I'm sitting here just being a sycophant for Amy Coney Barrett. She did actually kind of flub that one, I thought. Let's take a look. Um, what are the five freedoms of the First Amendment? Speech, religion, press, assembly, Speech, press, religion, assembly. I don't know what am I missing. Redress or protest. Okay. Um, why, why is there one amendment that has these five freedoms clustered? Why do they hang together? Um, I don't know what you're getting at on that one. You mean like what is the common denominator? Yeah, I mean why, why I'm getting back to the same idea that the Bill of Rights was sort of an attempt to do public catechesis. It was an attempt to say we already believe in limited government. We the founders. That's the, the brilliance of the miracle at Philadelphia despite all the failures to live up to our ideals. But the 1787, uh, 1788 conversation was to say we believe in limited government because we believe in the limitless rights of people. And so they didn't have a Bill of Rights but later when they started spelling it out it's sort of like they got jazzed up trying to, to work <laughs> this out for the American people. This is amazing stuff. Yeah, so Ben's, Ben, he just kind of answers his own question there. He was trying to tee her up to, you know, do something with that and she just wasn't feeling it she didn't understand what his question was there and uh you know that being said i still think you know petition for a redress of grievances that was one i missed and i uh kind of feel like you know a little a little uh little down on myself for that one but i'll let i'll let it go all right so we move on now we say let's move on now over to chris coons chris coon is is from delaware and he you know he's kind of a bland senator uh very kind of monotone in his conversation he asks questions that are carefully planned and he waits for an answer nothing nothing really you know no, no real fireworks here but let's take a look at what he had to say you said and i'm quoting about modern originalists that they've abandoned the claim one should be an originalist because originalism produces more restrained judges do you stand by that characterization? Well, Senator Coons, um, I just want to point out that in this whole discussion, you know, I did write that Colorado article in 2003, 
Um, I don't recall that sentence or its context, but in my full body of work, including everything that's come before, including the 2013 Texas Law Review article, I've written at great length about the virtues of stare decisis and the stability interest it serves. And in my scholarship, I've also talked about other features of the judicial system. Um, and also, I'd like to point out that nothing in my record in the Seventh Circuit shows disrespect for stare decisis. And also, Justice Scalia did observe and follow precedent. It's not like Justice Scalia ever advocated an overthrow of stare decisis. So I just don't think there's any evidence to suggest that I'm um, in there trying to burn up the 600 volumes of United States reports that are on the shelf. I don't have an agenda in that regard. Yeah. And, and they're doing a lot of this. They're really trying to get her, her position on precedent. They're so, they're so focused on precedent and precedent. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically saying that you, you're leaning on what has already been decided. So if there was a court case that was decided, you know, 20 years ago in your court, in your jurisdiction, and your issue is related to that, you're going to lean on that because that's already been decided. There are prior judges who've done their own analysis. They've, they've you know ruled on a case, ruled on some issues and made sure that that is settled law according to the judiciary. And so you're leaning back on that. And there's a very specific process that the court goes through, an analytical framework, which Amy Coney Barrett has written more than, I mean, more than virtually anybody. Almost all of the work that we talked about on this channel was about stare decisis, was about precedent. She's highly, highly sophisticated in this area. And so these people are asking her about precedent because they want to get her to, to sort of, you know, open the door for this this idea that she is just going to get in there and start throwing away precedent. So they're asking her about it so they can pin her down. So she's on record as saying, no, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do that. We're going to follow the same rules. And in particular, they're talking about, of course, Roe versus Wade. That's the only issue that, 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 you know, why this matters. A lot of the other cases that are going to be coming up before the court are new issues. They, you know, they're new novel issues that we're going to be addressing, uh, like in particular, the Affordable Care Act. That's a pretty new thing. But Roe versus Wade is old. It's been around for a while and there are other cases that rely on it. So what they want to do is get her to say that the precedent doesn't, you know, doesn't apply or give them an in to say, well, see what she said about precedent. See, uh, all of these other sacred ground cases are all, you know, they're all in jeopardy. And she's just saying, no, I mean, you, I've, I've written about it. I wrote about it. I have no idea why you think I want to just rip out and, and throw away 600 volumes of legal precedent. It's not what she wants to do. Uh, and so, you know, not a lot there, but I thought a good answer. We move over to Josh Howley from Missouri. And he talks specifically about uh, the COVID order, which we covered on this channel. So if you remember, this, this is a case called Pritzer, I think is the name of it. And what they're talking about here specifically is there was a lockdown order that said you have to lock down, right? Much like everywhere, we had one in Arizona. And as a part of this order, there was an exclusion. So saying everybody had to lock down, but we're going to exclude religious organizations. They are sort of, you know, exempt from a lot of these same requirements because of the fact that religious is religion is so important. It's so fundamental. It's in our first amendment and we want to make sure this is protected. So they're carving out an exception. Well, what happened was the Republican party, I forget what state this was in. They came around and said, well, Hey, Hey, hang, hang on. If you're going to give the religious people an exemption, uh, our, privileges to uh, assemble is right in the First Amendment, right? We just heard that from Amy Coney Barrett, your freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. And we want to assemble, says the Republican Party. We want to do our rallies. We want to go out and, and do these things and organize and get involved in the political world. And the governor is saying we can't do that. So now they challenge that under equal protection and due process of law and all of those constitutional concepts. And what Amy Coney Barrett's going to say is that yeah, you know, well, here what we're talking about is that carving out for religion is okay. And the non carve out for the Republican political activity is not okay. And, you know, if you've been following me on this channel for a while, I'm not a fan of the lockdowns. I'm not a fan of the government telling people who are private people what they can and cannot do. If there's a gym in that's open and it's a private gym and a private person is operating that gym and I want to go work out there, we're two private adults consenting to share a facility and some heavy weights together. We should be allowed to do that. Uh, we know what the risks are. We're adults. We don't need the nanny government holding our hand and monitoring our every mood. If, if we want to go do that, we should be able to do that. That's my opinion. But Amy Coney Barrett, you know, her, her position is a little bit more, I would say, in favor of the government and their authority to craft how people are interacting in their daily lives. So she's saying, yeah, for religion, we're going to carve out that exception, but for the other stuff, not so much. So here's her answer on that issue. 
size case recently. You were on the panel. You didn't write the decision. This is the Pritzker case. Illinois Republican Party versus Pritzker decided on September 3rd of this year. So it's quite recent. It was just last month. This is a case in which the governor of the state uh, was sued because in the words now of the opinion I'm quoting, his executive order relating uh, to COVID lockdowns, quote now, exhibits special solicitude for the free exercise of religion. And the case in a roundabout way, challenge that special solicitude for churches and religious organizations. You joined the opinion in full, you, you didn't dissent. Can, can you say why you joined the opinion and, and why, you, why you think that the content here is, is right, why the holding is correct? Sure. So in that case, the Illinois Republican Party said that because the executive order in Illinois had given an exception for the free exercise of religion, for example, so that people could gather at churches or synagogues or mosques, um, that that same special protection had to extend to the Illinois Republican Party and indeed by logical extension to everyone so that the whole order would fall because religion couldn't be singled out for special treatment and that that right to free speech, free assembly, et cetera, um, that, that it was under First Amendment doctrine, a content-based distinction that could not survive. And what that opinion said about that is that it was permissible for the governor of Illinois to carve out an exception for free exercise, and that doing so didn't compel the government to extend the same protection to everyone. As Judge, as Judge Wood said you know, very well in that opinion, um, trying to accommodate a right explicitly mentioned in the Constitution and the First Amendment did not put the COVID order in jeopardy. Yeah, and I just... I, 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 I think the, I think that exception should be bigger or just not an exception at all. How about that? How about we just say, yeah, you know, people are, are if, if you're consenting and you want to go escape these lockdowns and do things with another person who's consenting, I know what my living situation is. You know what your living situation is. We can both be responsible. Uh, that's just how I would interpret it. Now, again, on this channel, I am pro freedom, pro liberty. That's what we want. So when we have orders that are taking away freedom and taking away liberty, that's when I have issues with those. And Amy Coney Barrett joined in on the opinion. So she was part of the solution that carved out an exemption for the religious, which is not not bad. I just don't think it's quite enough. I think there are a lot of other really fundamental liberties that were taken away as a result of these lockdown orders. And uh, I was, I've been critical of them basically since the imposition of them. So, uh, you know, not, not particularly thrilled with that answer, but I understand why she came to that ruling. All right. So we move on. We're going to go back to Senator Blumenthal. So let's take a look at what he has to say. Senator Blumenthal. Oh, yeah. Before we get there, we learn a little bit. So he uh, he asks her how she was doing after the day yesterday. She says, I had a glass of wine after last night. I'm back, uh, Judge Barrett, and to your family as well. I hope you got some rest uh, <laughs> last night. I think that's true of all of us. So I did have a glass of wine. I'll tell you that I needed that at the end of the day. Well, let me just say on that kind of point, you have a right to remain silent. <laughs> Nothing illegal about a glass of wine there, Senator, but uh, but but interesting nonetheless, right? I mean, that, that was one of those those phrases you, you wonder if that was intended to be put out there or not. Remember, these people, everything here is highly orchestrated and highly scripted. So, you know, she had a glass of wine. Is that uh, as we're going to get to here, she we're going to hear more from her about kind of how difficult and how arduous this entire process has been. And uh, well, we'll leave some commentary to that when we get there. But Senator Blumenthal, he asks her about whether courts should decide elections in this next clip. So this is another big theme that we've seen a lot of. Uh, is the president going to contribute to a you know a peaceful transition of power? There's been a lot of uh, com complaints, I would say, about how she answered that question yesterday when Cory Booker was talking about it. And so uh, this one is now about whether the courts should decide elections. And so these questions are so broad and so generic, it's just really easy for her to just swat them away. So let's take a look at what Senator Blumenthal asks her now. I want to ask you, should courts, specifically the Supreme Court, be deciding the next presidential election? Um, so the presidential election, as with all elections, is a matter of put to the voters to cast ballots. But the presumption should be against the courts deciding an election. It's the people and the voters who should decide, correct? Um, let's say Senator Blumenthal. So I think that occasions on which courts adjudicate election disputes are designed to protect the voters' choice and the right to vote. So of course the Supreme Court doesn't cast ballots. Voters cast ballots and election law is designed to protect the right to vote. The courts should do everything possible to avoid embroiling themselves in election politics. Ruscio versus Common Cause says that, for example, um, gerrymandering is a political question because it's difficult in many circumstances for courts to develop judicially manageable standards to... Presumption should be against courts getting involved. Let me ask you about... Yeah, so uh, really, really rock solid answers there. Now that was a sped up clip, but what she's doing there is is basically agreeing with Senator Blumenthal. So he's saying, right, courts should not be the ones who decide elections, right? And she says, obviously, yeah, obviously, the voters do. And what the courts should do is make sure that the process that the voters are engaging in is ensuring that their votes count, 
I 100% agree with you, Senator. And then, and then he tried, then, you know, it's, it's the perfect answer. So he doesn't know what to do with it. So then he goes on to the next question. He says, well, uh, the court shouldn't get involved or they shouldn't embroil, embroil themselves in it. And she's like, what? the hell are you talking about? And then he says, yeah, so they shouldn't get embroiled in. And then he goes on to the next question. So, you know, her, her answer is, is exactly right. The courts should be ensuring that the voting process is going according to plan. We're seeing a lot of election stuff going on right now. This is going to be the next chapter of what I think the, the legal community in the United States is concerned about. We're already seeing both the Democrats and the Republicans just teeing up their legal teams in all of the different jurisdictions around the country. And if there's any states that are close, you better believe there are going to be lawsuits because what's and what's happening a lot is the rules are trying to be changed. Different states and different different you know politicians, different city councils, different local municipalities or, or different states are all changing their rules a little bit. More time for COVID, mail in instead of regular, you know, these 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 really sort of rapid fire modifications of the voting systems are being done very, very quickly. We see, you know, different uh, problems with signature requirements and witness requirements. And if these rules are changing on the fly, then the court needs to de determine how to decipher all of that, right? If, if your homework is due Friday night at 5 p.m. and you don't turn it in until Monday at 10 p.m., but you go to the teacher and you say, yeah, but I couldn't turn it in at 5 p.m. because of the coronavirus or because uh, the dog ate my homework or something like that. Well, the teacher has to decide, okay, well, how are we going to interpret this issue? What are we going to do with this? I said it was due at 5 p.m. on Friday night. You didn't get it in. Therefore, it doesn't count. Have you had teachers like that? I certainly have. And I've been uh, on the receiving end of their horrendousness, right? But on the other end, some judges will look at it and they'll say, yeah, you know, the intent of this statute, we want to give the voice to the voters. If they get it in late, if they don't have a witness, if, it does, if they don't use the right envelope, then maybe we let that in. And so there's a couple different ways, that, right? The teacher could say, yeah, Monday is no problem because I think that's a valid excuse. That's happening all over the country. Well, if you have a situation where the teacher there says it's due by five and the court says it's due by Monday, and now we've got this sort of gray area. What about all the people who turned it in Friday night after five, Saturday and Sunday? What happens to all their ballots? These, this is what the courts are going to be dealing with for the foreseeable future. And what Amy Coney Barrett is answering is, yeah, we got to protect that. We got to make sure that that process is done well and that the voters intent, the voters will is being carried out. I don't think at any point throughout this hearing or in anything she's ever written that she said that the Supreme Court should decide the election. Uh, that's just a... It's just a political phrase that really has very little meaning. All right. So as I had mentioned, we we do hear from Amy Coney Barrett in particular about the hardships of this entire ordeal. So uh, as you would know, you know, anybody in this position, we saw this with Judge Kavanaugh. You know, the families are just raked through the coals on these things. Very long, very arduous process. And so I want to play this exchange between her and Senator Tom Tillis from North Carolina, where he's asking her a little bit about this. And, and, and uh, you're going to hear this quickly. But at the very beginning, I wanted to point out that, you know, there's there's some some personal relationship here. So there was a conversation that took place prior to the confirmation hearing today where Amy Coney Barrett was actually signed some pocket constitutions for Senator Tillis's, uh, I think, daughters and, you know, or, or grandchildren or whatever it is. And so, you know, there's there's a personal rapport here. And so this is one of those moments that I like to see from candidates. I like to see how they act personally and how this entire thing is, is impacting them and their families rather than the political pontifications from the senators who go on for 25 minutes without asking a question. Doesn't do anything for us except really waste our time. But we've got a good question here and a good answer. So let's listen. Whoa. All right. Well, my PowerPoint just crashed. So let me get that back up. Apologies. All right. So we're scrolling back over. Here is that clip. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, I met a couple of weeks ago. I have to thank you again. My uh, daughter was thrilled that you signed the two pocket constitutions for my two granddaughters, and uh, they'll cherish it someday when I can explain what it really means. It's going to take a few more years. One is three, and the other one's eight, uh, eight weeks. But, uh, you know, I really enjoyed that discussion. And I ask you there something I'd like for you to, to share with the committee. You have stellar academic credentials. Uh, you have stellar record as a professor, and you've done an excellent job on the Seventh Circuit. Um, 
you've been a great uh, mother and, uh, and wife. You have so many options. There are so many things that you could be doing besides going through the first confirmation hearing, which was not pleasant. I was here and I remember it. Um, and you knew that this, this was even gonna be more challenging. So I asked you when we met, why would you do this? Knowing how this was gonna play out, knowing that you were gonna be attacked and unfairly treated. And I think uh, to a level of maybe where some of your constitutional rights have been uh, questionably denied. So why are you doing this, Judge Barrett? Why not just say thanks but no thanks, leave it for somebody else? Well, as I said to Senator Graham yesterday, and I think this was part you know, and parcel of the conversation that you and I had, that this is a very difficult process. Actually, I think I've used the word excruciating um, over the weeks and, and uh, knowledge that you know, people are gonna say horrible things, you know, that you, your entire life will be combed over, that you'll be mocked, you know, that your children will be attacked. Um, and so one might wonder why any sane person would undertake that risk and that task unless it was for the sake of something good. And as I said yesterday to Senator Graham, I do think the rule of law and uh, its importance in the United States, and I do think the rule of the Supreme Court is important, it's a great good. Um, it would be difficult for anybody in this seat. I think everybody knows the confirmation process is very difficult. And so for me to say no, I mean, other people could do this job, but the same difficulty will be present for everyone. Um, and so for me to say, you know, I'm not willing to undertake it, even though I think this is something important, um, would be, you know, a little cowardly. And, you know, I wouldn't be answering a call to serve my country in the way that I was asked. I also think in our conversation, I said, you know, that my children were part of the reason not to do it because, you know, my son Liam got very upset yesterday during the questioning, and so, you know, we had to call him in the car. He didn't stick it out to the end. Um, you know, I was surprised he stuck it out as long as he did. But Liam got very upset at, at the questioning, and, and Senator Kennedy, re Kennedy referenced some of the other things that have happened to the children in the process. And so I, I said to you before any of that happened that in many ways the children are the reason not to do it, but they're also the reason to do it because if we are to protect our institutions and protect the freedoms and protect the rule of law that's the basis for the society and the freedom that we all enjoy, if we want that for our children and our children's children, then we need to participate in that work. Well, I yeah, I mean, a pretty powerful statement, right? You know, obviously we can't put ourselves in her shoes, but she is at the, has been in the very, very brightest of spotlights that any person can be in, in this country. She's uh, you know, been for the last several weeks now has just been the subject of a lot of scathing commentary from both sides, from all different angles. And obviously that is something that would be difficult, but a couple thoughts on what she had said about this process, a couple things. First, I didn't think that this hearing, so today is really the close of questioning. I really didn't think that this hearing was as bad as many of the other hearings. I actually thought that most of the senators were on their, their sort of best behavior, uh, more so than we saw in the Senate, in the uh, Judge Kavanaugh hearings, where they were really just sort of foaming at the mouth. I mean, it was very vitriolic, very aggressive, very condescending, very insulting. We didn't see much of that here, quite frankly. I thought that this was actually pretty, pretty benign relative to some of the other confirmation hearings that we have seen. And uh, th now that's not to say that I take away from anything that her and her family are going through. I do think, however, that uh, she, you know, she's got seven children and she's got a, sort of a dynamic family. And a lot of people have a lot of really strong opinions about some of this stuff. And so I think that's probably where the excruciating this of this all comes into play for her is seeing how this is impacting her family. Uh, you know, how, how, what people are saying about her adopting two black children from Haiti, you know, people are having some gross comments about that. Uh, you know, people are saying that she's basically like the handmaid's tale. You know, you see all those memes going around. I have not seen that show. And so I don't really get the meme other than it's this sort of bizarre thought that she as this really accomplished, incredibly brilliant, one of the most you know, impactful people in our country that somehow she wants to enslave women or make them all subjugated or something. I don't, I don't understand it, but that is the meme that's going around. And I'm sure that that type of stuff is very hurtful. I would say in particular to her family and how that impacts her. I'm not a father. I don't know how it feels when your when your children are upset that you are you know, the subject of this type of inquisition. And so I just, I can't relate to that, but I can relate as an attorney. And quite frankly, I didn't think this hearing was particularly grueling and probably not even that difficult for her, for Amy Coney Barrett, somebody of this caliber, somebody who's used to sitting on the bench for long periods of time, who's used to doing oral arguments really from the other end as a judge who's you know sort of questioning people and somebody who's just been a lawyer for a long period of time. Uh, she had two full days of questioning. If you recall on Monday, she had just her opening statement. Then on Tuesday, she was there for eight hours. And today she was there for probably about seven hours. And so, you know, not particularly grueling days. Uh, many people don't know this, but the bar exam is two full days of testing. 
right? In Arizona, it's two full days. I also passed the bar in California. That's three full days, three full days of testing. And that means you're sitting there in a room on a laptop, just banging out questions and doing multiple choice questions, about a minute a question, just flying through. It's very taxing. It's very mentally grueling. And to do that for three days, it's almost like a marathon, right? You just, if you finish it, then that is an achievement in and of itself, let alone passing it. So, you know, this is something I think she's got the the training for if she's got the experience for i don't think this part of it was the grueling part you know receiving the questions just sitting there in fact she didn't even take that many questions quite honestly most of the republican senators just talked and talked and talked so that she didn't have to answer questions and a lot of the senators on the democratic side talked and talked and talked because she wouldn't answer questions uh, because she couldn't do to all the different confines so you know one of those things where I have no doubt in my mind that this was incredibly stressful, incredibly taxing, but from her own demeanor and from the way that she just kind of just coasted through this entire hearing process without getting rattled, without getting uh, you know too irritated, without losing her cool in any way, I thought she was in total control and total command of it at literally every minute. And uh, for that reason, I think she's going to be confirmed with... Uh, with no problem at all. All right, so let me take a quick pause because my PowerPoint flew, uh, took a took a crash. So let me move this baby back over here so I can see what is next. Thank all you. right. That one, you know, I'm at a couple. So we got that one. Let's go over to Senator Hirono. Senator Hirono, we're not, we, no clips from her. She doesn't ask any questions anyways. She goes through and she's talking about uh, the same thing that we heard from Senator Whitehouse. So remember, Senator Whitehouse uh, also was talking about the Abood case, which you know, he had, a, I would say, a less sophisticated graphic that he was covering. And she has this really nice printed out, you know, hey, uh, Senator Hirono looks good. Same cases, the Knox case, Harris case, Friedrichs, and so on. And so nothing, nothing really substantive there. I think she's actually probably the most ineffective senator for the Democrats when it comes to asking questions. Uh, very, very strange, very all over the place. She's trying to make points, but she just doesn't do a very good job of it. Um, let's go over to Senator Cory Booker. And this is where we're going to see a little bit of, a, of the, the same old kind of shtick that we're used to. We've seen it this entire hearing where they'll say, listen, I just want to ask you just a simple question. I know, I know, I know about all the judicial rules. I know about, you know, active cases and controversies clause. I get it all, but you're a mom. Just, just answer this as a simple person. Like you would agree with me, right? That you shouldn't be separating children from their parents, right? Go back to asking uh, just a simple question that I hope you'll feel comfortable asking. It's just uh, what I think is an obvious answer again. Um, but do you think it's wrong to separate children from their parents to deter immigrants from coming to the United States? Well, Senator Booker, that's been a matter of policy debate. And, you know, obviously that's a matter of hot political debate in which I can't express a view or be drawn into as a judge. So I, I, I respect that a lot. But I think the underlying question is actually not hotly debated. And, and just maybe I'll answer it, ask it one more time. Do you think it's wrong to separate a child from their parent, not for the sake of the child or parent, but to send a message? Uh, as a human being, do you believe that that's wrong? Well, Senator, I think you're trying to engage me on the administration's border and separation policies, and I can't express a view on that. So I, I'm not expressing assent or dissent with the morality of that position. I just can't be drawn into a debate about the administration's immigration policy. Right. And yeah, and it, it, oh, he, and he's he's so he's so funny about the way he asks those questions, where he just says, "Yeah, I listen. I really respect that. I really do. But I just have to ask you again." I mean, it's so transparent in my mind that it's it's almost comical because we all know what he's trying to do. Does anybody buy that shtick that uh, that he he's just being a nice guy? I don't think so. Um, so he's a little bit frustrated because she's not answering a question because he's asking a question about a specific case in controversy. And so he's a little bit frustrated that, you know, she's not playing his game. But that's that's the whole point. He's she's not playing any of their games. All right. Let's go over to Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. Let's go over to her. Uh, she is appearing virtually. So this is what she looked like today. I didn't I didn't catch her yesterday. I thought that uh, maybe she didn't ask questions, but apparently she did. I think they're saving her for the very end on both days so that uh, by the time she goes, 
everybody's already checked out. Nobody's paying attention anymore. I think that is truthfully the strategy behind that. But she's not good at this. She is not good at this at all. For somebody who is a former prosecutor, I was a little bit surprised by her questions today and just how how sort of poor she was at delivering them. And let me let me flesh that out a little bit further. So uh, first and foremost, I don't know why she's appearing virtually. I think that's a huge mistake. You can't get a good question in virtually. We already saw that with Leahy, where he tried to ask her a question and she couldn't hear him and they cut each other off. It's just very ineffective. It doesn't look good. And it's not it's not easy to read body language and to see when somebody's stopping and, 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 and speaking and, and start your own sentence in return. So I think that part of it was ineffective. Now, as she asks these questions, they're also they're they're also, you know, the same type of questions, the same form and and response type of question that all of the other senators have already asked. So she knows that she's going to get the same answer from Amy Coney Barrett that everybody else has gotten for the last day and three quarters of a day at this point. And so she starts kind of going into this weird question and then Amy responds and says, I'm not going to really answer that. And then she uses this word fact versus a proposition. And so then Senator Harris just lunges, lunges on that. She's like, oh, did you say fact or did you say proposition? And they're just really singling that one out. And this just reminds it's just it's it's bad. It's bad form. It's bad arguments. It's like when you're having a conversation with somebody or and you say, well, um, you know, the car was beige and they say, oh, the car was beige, huh? Well, just so you know, the car was actually tan, but you said it was beige. And so, and they just latch onto that one fact. Oh, beige car. You said, no, you said it was beige. You said it was beige. That's kind of what is happening here. She said, oh, oh, you're calling it a proposition. So you don't think it's a fact. You think it's just a proposition, huh? Even though John Roberts said that, said it in his opinion. And so it's this really like combative approach. I think she's trying to look you know, overly tough or play that prosecutor mold, but it just, it doesn't come off well and it comes off even worse because she's trying to do this all telephonically. So let's hear this clip from the vice presidential candidate, Kamala Harris. In Shelby County, Chief Justice Roberts wrote, voting and quote, voting discrimination still exists. No one doubts that. And my question to you is, do you agree with Justice Roberts' statement? Um, Senator Harris, I, I want to just make sure that I understand um, that my understanding of what remains of the Voting Rights Act, what happened in Shelby County, is consistent with what you're describing. I, the preclearance requirement, as I understand Shelby County, remains in place, and what the Supreme Court held unconstitutional was the coverage formula. So some states, um, which in 1965 had a history of discrimination, had to get preclearance whenever they changed anything having to do with their voting procedures, and other states didn't. And I think Shelby County said that Congress can still pass a new coverage formula now, um, articulating the criteria for jurisdictions that are discriminating and requiring preclearance. Um, uh, my question, however, do you agree with Chief Justice Roberts, who said voting discrimination still exists? No one doubts that. Do you agree with that statement? Senator Harris, I will not comment on what any justice said in opinion, whether an opinion is right or wrong or, or endorse that proposition. There it is. Well, I'm asking you, do you, so do you call it a proposition or a fact? Um, Are you saying you do not agree with a fact? Senator, I'm not going to make a comment. I'm not going to say that I endorse either the majority or the dissent in the case of Shelby County. Well, I just want to understand, are you saying that you will, uh, you refuse to dispute a known fact or that you refuse to agree with a known fact? Senator, what is she I'm not talking exactly about? Sure what you're getting at with asking me to endorse the fact or whether any particular practice constitutes voter discrimination. I'm very happy to say that I think racial discrimination still exists in the United States, and I think we've seen evidence of that this summer. But as Do you think that voting discrimination exists based on race in America in any form? Senator Harris, um, there have been cases. We talked in this hearing about the Wisconsin case that went up to the court um, involving voting. I think anything, any opinion that I would express um, and I don't mean to signal that I disagree with the statement either. What I mean to say is I'm not going to express an opinion because these are very charged issues. They have been litigated in the courts, and so I will not engage on that question. Yeah, just not even uh, not even effective. So she reads a quote from John Roberts, who's talking about racism. John Roberts is the chief justice on the Supreme Court, so uh, th that that wasn't a wasn't a statement of a fact. It was a quote from an opinion from the chief justice. And so then when she starts, when she calls it a proposition, then Kamala Harris wants to change that statement, her own quote, and then say, well, it's a fact. And so now she's saying, are you challenging the fact? And now we're asking ourselves, well, what fact is she talking about? Is she saying that is the fact referring to John Roberts quote? Like, is she saying that that is the fact? Because I don't think Amy Coney Barrett was talking about that, or I don't think Kamala Harris was talking about that. I think she was saying that this had to do with this idea that the, there's a fact that the Voting Rights Act, you know, whatever the point she was making was with racism, which really wasn't a point. So just a poorly articulated question. She just seized on this word called proposition versus fact. And I don't think she knew really where to go with it, but she just sort of, you know, went back into her prosecutorial 
uh, chops. Remember, she's a former prosecutor. And so she thinks that that she's going to be aggressive with this individual. And there, it's really just a poor conversation. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett has no idea what she's asking. I don't know what she's asking. I don't think she knows what she's asking, but uh, she asked it anyways. So that was from Kamala. We've got one more clip from her. This is where, uh, well, let's see what she says here. To protect workers and place them on equal footing. Do you recognize Justice Ginsburg's point that there is, quote, extreme imbalance of power between large corporations and individual workers? Um, Senator Harris, I'm going to give you the same answer that I gave you with respect to the sentence that you quoted me from Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in Shelby County, that I just, I'm not going to engage in critiquing um, or embracing portions of opinions, especially opinions that have been recently decided and are contentious from the court. Yeah, and then Kamala Harris goes on and closes up after that. I mean, nothing really consequential out of that. I don't think she's very particularly good at that um, that job. So she closes it up, says the whole things uh, shouldn't be happening. She's going to be a hard no vote in one man's opinion. All right, so let's take a look at the last one. Well, there were other senators, but this was my last one. We're going to wrap up with this. Then we're going to go over to the chat. So this is this is Senator Kennedy from Kentucky. I think that's where he's from. This is my favorite guy in the entirety of all of the hearings, uh, in large part because of his glasses. Amazing, amazing choreography with these glasses. Let's listen. Judge, let's try to answer some of Senator Harris's uh, accusations. <clears throat> Are you a racist? I am not a racist, Senator Kennedy. You sure? I'm positive. Do you support, in all cases, corporations over working people? I do not, and I think if you look at my record, you will see cases in which I've decided in favor of plaintiffs, not corporations. Are you against clean air, bright water, and environmental justice? I'm not against. Any of those things, those are policies that the Congress has pursued in many statutes, and I think we all reap the benefits of when those statutes work. Do you support science? I do, and I help my children with their homework when they're trying to learn it. You're sure of that? I am sure I believe in science, and I support science. Do you, do you support children and prosperity? I support children, seven of my own, and then support other, you know, obviously think children are our future, support children, and yes, I support prosperity. Do you hate little warm puppies? <laughs> I do not hate little warm puppies. Okay, I just want to get all that clear. All right. So kind of a fun little lighthearted way to end our coverage of the actual confirmation part of the hearings. So tomorrow, my understanding is they are going to have the committee vote at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So by the time I wake up about well, by the time, about six o'clock tomorrow morning, my time will have uh, at least the hearings will have started. Don't know how long those are going to take. Uh, hopefully, it's just a quick up and down vote. I'm sure there's going to be some argument and some some other statements that are being made. But uh, I would very much like to cover other things. So I'm looking forward to this getting wrapped up. Uh, all right, let's run over to the chat. I know uh, that this is something that uh, you know a lot of a lot of you regular subscribers are here for more of the juicy content, which we will get back into. But we just want to make sure that we are here on the record covering this stuff, because as I've said, I do think this is a momentous moment for us. All right, so let's take a look at some of the chat. If you are not already chatting, now's a good time to get started. Let's warm those fingers up. Let's get those keyboards warmed up, and let's say, uh, let's say, hi, Faith. Let's say everybody say, hi, Faith, because she's back there helping me with the show on a regular basis. So let's get those started up, and I'm going to open the chat say right hi. now. And uh, let's see what's going on. All right. So a couple questions. If the Supreme Court ruled that nonviolent felons could have their Second Amendment rights, what would that look like? Would they be able to go to a gun store the next day or would there be other steps first? Yeah, so that's a great question, a really great question. And I'm not sure how the individual states would process that, but let, let me give you an example from Arizona. So in Arizona, if you are convicted of a felony, then the judge will literally mark is part of their order, the final order. They'll say this person is prohibited from possessing a firearm and you know they'll actually delineate those things. So all of that will then go over to the clearinghouse at the Arizona Department of Public Safety, which keeps a record of all of these things and is sort of you know documenting all of this. So um, you know they're they're the agency that will then interface with the different agencies on the national level who will, you know, when, when, when they do a background check on you, they're the ones who will actually flag you and keep you out. So you sort of have to, you have to unwind that, right? That's like a long series of dominoes. If you have a criminal conviction, it's going to 
domino into these other agencies and it's going to spider web across the entire country. So how do you roll that back? How do you wheel that in? It's a good question. I think by and large, it would be as simple as just you know, the courts just saying, yeah, we're, this is, everything's been instantly modified and you're now allowed to go and, and possess firearms and it would just sort of invalidate all of those prior limitations. Now, if it's a situation where the Supreme Court comes back down and then says that uh, we actually have to distinguish, we have to go back through and decide whether a crime is dangerous or not, then you may actually have to submit another motion. So let's say, for example, that the ruling comes back and they say, yep, if you can confirm that your felony was non-dangerous, then we will go ahead and we'll lift that sanction, that the pro prohibition on having a federal firearm. So if they did that, then you as a defendant, somebody who was previously convicted, you may need to actually submit another motion to the court and say, yep, I, I want you to designate my felony conviction as non-dangerous if, if that's, you know, if that's how it, it would work. So a lot of it's going to depend on what the Supreme Court wants to do with it. But I don't think it would be too complicated, truthfully. I mean, if, especially if you were convicted and you were looking for some guidance, all you would do is just submit a secondary motion to the court and say, I'm looking for clarification on this. I know the Supreme Court just said that I, I am now allowed to have a firearm again. I believe my felony conviction was non-dangerous. Therefore, uh, please grant me that right. You submit it to the court. The judge would then review it and there'd be a little bit of due process there and then you'd get that right granted. When are they going to charge the guy shot in the bicep? So talking about the Rittenhouse case, uh, I'm not sure that he's going to be charged. I don't think he's been charged thus far. Yeah, uh, I am me and no one else. Kyle Rittenhouse is not being charged in Illinois with unlawful possession, I think. I did see that headline. I do believe Kyle Rittenhouse has another court date tomorrow. I think tomorrow his... This was the this was when he was going to... Uh, the, the state was going to respond to the petition for a writ of habeas corpus. So they were going to respond to that. I think tomorrow's their deadline. So uh, I'm waiting for a little bit more information, but I am going to have an update on Kyle Rittenhouse soon. People often claim, so this is from GG, people often claim that people like Kamala and Klobuchar are strong women. In my opinion, they are just angry and disrespectful. Strong woman is somebody as Amy Coney Barrett. What are your opinion on the senators? That's a pretty loaded question there. You know, I... I do, you know, if we're just talking about personal style and how they respond to questions and how they how they sort of comport themselves, I do think that Amy Coney Barrett is uh, somebody with a lot more confidence, a lot more grace, a lot more poise, somebody who just seems more like they're in command than a lot of the senators. And that's just not the women senators either. I mean, that's just everybody. I think I think almost everybody in that room. Amy Coney Barrett was just at a different caliber, at a different level. And so I understand the senators asking questions and I understand them getting frustrated and getting, you know, a little bit flustered. And you have to remember, too, part of this is just part of the show. You know, they have to be indignant. So I, I don't even necessarily believe that I genuinely uh, the, the attributes that we saw out of Klobuchar and out of Harris and out of White House, White House was also flailing around all over the place. You know, it's part of a spectacle. It's part of a show. They need to they need to put on a performance for their constituents back home. And so when they all go back home after this hearing is is uh, over, then they're going to be able to say, I really beat her up. You know, I went and I took her to task on like White House did with this this whole concoction of weird conspiracy theories about dark money. I, I really took him to task on money. Klobuchar can come back out. I really beat her up on the ACA. I told you, you know, she's going to overturn it. And so that's going to be their shtick on it. But I don't know that, um, I think one is more effective than the other. Certainly. I think Amy Coney Barrett is some, somebody to model. And this is, this is a, a, a large reason why I went to law school. I watched how chief justice or why I was so interested in law school, uh, I watched how Chief Justice John Roberts comported himself, and I thought, that guy is on point. You know, here I am in my young mid-20s trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life, and I look at this guy, and I think, wow, this guy just got beat up by all these really powerful senators, and he just was in total control of the situation the entire time. I had that same feeling with John Roberts. All right, yeah, and so Jesse Smollett, uh, who's who's apparently on the on the channel... <laughs> Uh, justice for Juicy, he says, not granted, Robert, restored. That's right. And th that is the actual correct phraseology for that. And so I apologize if I misspoke. But yeah, those rights are already yours. They've been suspended and you have to restore them. And uh, it's actually called a restoration of rights. We have a formal motion that we file here in Arizona.
She is definitely more composed. It's a one-sided discrimination against uh, W's. The agenda is W genocide. They are making emotional appeals directly to the American people. It's not about Amy, but it's about the election. I think that's that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, they know how she's going to answer these questions. They know how she's going to respond, but they ask the questions anyways, because they have an agenda. They have a, they have a goal as they should, right? They should have an agenda. They're senators. This is like, this is all part of the process. Now I do get tired of it. I do get tired of uh, 30 minutes. I think we could easily, you know, they all could have gotten a lot less time than that and had a lot less time to pontificate, but it's part of our politics and it's kind of like blood sport to a certain extent, right? It's why we're watching it. We want to see what's going to happen. It's easier from Zulu. What's up, Zulu? He says, it's easier to be composed when you're guaranteed to be bestowed with lifetime dominion over all American endeavors. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be, I think it would also be pretty, pretty stressful, right? I mean, this is something truly, I think Amy Coney Barrett, really anybody at this caliber, they have been essentially born and bred to be on the Supreme Court. Uh, you can look back at her history of writing. There was another senator during the confirmation hearings today, I forget who it was, who said specifically that she's written more than anybody who's on, on the court other than uh, Stephen Breyer. And he's got like three decades on her. And, you know, she's highly, highly accomplished, highly polished. But this is something where, you know, she, uh, she has written about very limited issues and all of the things that she has written about are the perfect topics for somebody to go on the Supreme Court. She didn't write about affirmative action or she didn't write about, you know, border issues or ACA or any of that stuff. I mean, if she did, she just touched on them very incidentally because she wanted to keep her record as bland as humanly possible. Only talking about precedent and stare decisis and all of these really uh, sort of uh, you know, kind of out there legal concepts that are very boring and bland. Nobody really cares about those unless you're in appellate work or unless you're working to be a judge. Everybody else is more concerned about, you know, things like we talk about here, qualified immunity and police brutality and justice reform and sentencing reform and cash bail and cash bond and all those things. Those are the juicy issues, but she's working on stare decisis. And it's because her entire career has been working towards this moment. So, you know, you would expect somebody like that to, to, to maybe get a little bit flustered or to, you know, to really be, uh, to be nervous because the stakes are so high. And I just didn't see that from her at all. I thought she just walked right in, said, I'm going to have a nice conversation with these people who know a lot less than I do. She did it well. If it is like blood sport, when does JCVD swing in and start kicking people in the face? Not one politician stands up for W's in any way. They won't even say the word. We have zero representation. In your opinion, should a person's decision to willingly enter a high conflict area with a firearm factor into a self-defense case? Does a person ever forfeit their expectation to personal safety? So those are really great questions. Yeah, really great, great questions. And I think those are going to be very fact-specific answers. Really, It really is going to depend on on the facts of the case. And I certainly think, so if we're talking about like, I posted a video yesterday about Matthew Doloff and you know, the idea that you just, you just go to these things and you can engage in armed combat or you can chest bump each other, or you can, you know, get really close to, to starting a fight. But then when a fight breaks out, suddenly claim self-defense, we're really meshing a lot of these different concepts together. So on that Matthew Dolot video, I spent a lot of time, well, not a lot of time, but we did look at the statute last night talking about uh, provocation and the initial aggressor and all of these types of concepts. So who was the, the provocateur there? Who was the initial aggressor and who was responding? And these things happen so quickly that when you're doing a legal analysis on it, basically what you're doing is you're trying to identify the sequence of events and, and break them out clearly. Who had the gun up first? When was the mace up? Uh, what's the level of threat? What is What would a reasonable person in those positions do from both sides? And it's so blurry and it's so muddied up that you really can't come to a conclusion on that. I think you're going to have to do a fact-intensive fact, fact intensive analysis, and then it's going to be up for the jury to decide. So I think, truthfully, in a Matthew Doloff case like that, I think a jury can go either way on those. And it's really going to be up to the, to the maybe, maybe not the Matthew Doloff case. I think that one's pretty cut and dry based on the video that we put out yesterday, but you get, you catch my point. There are situations where reasonable people could look at a situation and they could disagree 
One person can come out on one side, one person can come out on the other side. That's why these issues are so contested. But the point is, it needs to go in front of a judge and a jury. Uh, you know, personally, I would not put myself in those positions. I have not put myself in those positions because I think it is sort of inviting that that possibility. I, you know, it obviously doesn't happen. There are protests all over the country that are taking place, and people don't drop dead. But there's a higher likelihood that you're going to drop dead at one of those protests than if you're sitting in your chair at your office. Right? I don't think anybody could even argue that. So there is a there is an increased likelihood of that. And quite frankly, I don't know what I understand. I, I'm a, a huge proponent of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and this idea that we can get together and petition our government for a redress of grievances. I love the idea of civic involvement. I'm involved in a lot of different civic things around my community and it's important to me. And so I, I think that is all important. But when you have these two different groups, you know, both the, the Antifa BLM people and the, the protesters, the proud boys, the uh, whatever, on the other side, these are two people when they get together and they mash themselves into these little confines, are they doing anything productive? Are they doing anything that's going to really further the cause of American governance? No, not at all. I don't see anything going on there that's positive. It's just two groups of angry people smashing stones at each other. And it just is not, it's not productive at all. So I can't, I just, I can't get behind it. And I long, long time ago, uh, disavowed both the protesters and the rioters and got a lot of flack for that. The guy who shot first just just before Kyle shot his first four at the guy chasing him was identified. At least that's what is that's what the news said today. Yeah, I did see that headline. I saw that there there was an, I think an arrest that was made in that case, or he's actually being charged. All right, Benny's question about high conflict areas and self defense. Yeah, it's a great question, very good question, and again, it's it's an unsatisfying answer on that. But I, I do think it's going to be something that is going to be fact based. What's your opinion on changing the confirmation vote for the Supreme Court from a simple majority to a super majority to av avoid partisanship? Um, you know, I, I, I don't really have a strong opinion on that one way or another. I don't think I, I do think that it is, it is an interesting concept Super majority status is really hard to reach. I mean, especially today, think about think about how that would work today. I mean, could you ever get to super majority status? I don't know. I really don't. I mean, you'd have to pick middle of the road candidates. I just don't even know that that would would that would that that would work. Um, at least for something like this, like a Supreme Court nomination. All right. Is there an accepted definition of reasonable? So that's a great question. So reasonable, you spent a lot of time on this thinking about this concept. So the, the word reasonable is supposed to be what's called an objective standard, right? So let's say, for example, we're talking about Matthew Doloff, right? If we're, if we're looking at Matthew Doloff's case from an, a subjective standard, that means what did Matthew Doloff think? What did he feel? What did he experience? personally? What did he as that an individual experience during this interaction with Lee Keltner? What was that all about? We're talking about him specifically, right? So he can come around and say, I felt, I felt fear for my life. I felt like I was going to die. I felt like this guy was going to attack me or he was going to mace me. And he was going to, once I was on the ground, rob me and kill me and murder my whole family. Right. And he could say that. And we wouldn't even be able to argue with that because we weren't him. We're not in his shoes. According to his subjective view of the world, that's what he experienced. And that's what he felt. And so the law says, that's great. Uh, you may have felt that, but we're not asking that. We're not asking what you individually felt. That's a subjective standard. We're asking what did, what would a reasonable person, an objective, everyday person in your shoes who's reasonable, what would they feel? And that's where you come up to a lot of disagreements, right? And it's, it's more of an objective standard. It's about what a, just a, a like picture, just a, a generic person who's acting reasonably. If they were in Matthew Doloff's shoes, would they have responded the same way that he did? And you can make arguments both ways, right? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that if you have a firearm and somebody has a can of mace and they're spraying at your direction and you shoot them and kill them, I don't think that's a reasonable response. Now, there's other alternative, there's other arguments, right? Saying that 
that he actually, Lee Keltner actually had a gun and that he was reaching for it or something to that effect. I haven't uh, taken a deep dive into those arguments, but that's the difference. And so what is reasonable is what we as a society, you know, a person of standard intelligence, a person of standard you know, mental faculties, what would they do in that position? So reasonable can be a lot of different things. There really is no key definition for it. It's more of that objective standard versus a subjective standard because you can you can pass laws for a, sub, a, a an objective standard. You can't pass laws for every single Matthew Doloff. You just can't do that. So you have to uh, turn it into something that's more applicable to everybody else. Watching you daily says at R&R Law Group, you handle civil issues for someone that got swatted. We do not do civil law. We only do criminal law. We want to be very, very good at one thing, and that's what we focus on. Question, Amy claims, this is from I am, me, and no one else. Amy claims that Roe versus Wade is not super precedent. Your thoughts? I totally agree with that. Her analysis, I think, was spot on on that. Uh, I think there is a lot of evidence to the contrary, that Roe versus Wade is actually not super precedent because, it, in my opinion, it's, it's written, it's, it's constructed poorly. And again, this is not a commentary on the result of Roe versus Wade. It's not a commentary on whether abortion should be legal or not. But the statutory or the, the, uh, the, the case construction, the way that they reasoned in that opinion is not good. It's more like judicial activism, like this uh, judicial, what they're trying to do is actually f create new rules and new fundamental privileges and new rights in the judiciary when all of that should be reserved to the legislative branch, to the congressional branch. And so I don't think that Roe versus Wade is, is really even good precedent, quite frankly. I just don't. I think it's bad precedent. And uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what the judges do with it. Now, again, it is so political that the judges may not want to touch it because if they overturn it, then it's going to really hurt the legitimacy of the court because for the last 20, 30 years, or at least as long as I've been alive, Roe versus Wade, Wade is the stake in the ground for the left. It's their, it's their defining case. So many people don't even know what it means or what it stands for. Many people know about Roe versus Wade, but they don't know anything about Casey versus Planned Parenthood which is really the better precedent. If they're going to rely on precedent, it really should be Casey, not Roe. But if Roe is overturned, and that's on the headlines on all the newspapers and on the social media, Roe versus Wade is overturned, there's going to be a meltdown of epic proportions around the country, and people are going to, uh, the court's going to feel it for sure. So they may just not want to touch that because the issue is just too hot. Prosecutors, this comes from Four Veritas. Prosecutors, uh, protesters and looters seem to assume that business owners will be compensated by insurance companies. Is this usually the case? Uh, probably, if they have a good insurance policy. Uh, I, I think that, that, that it would be covered. But pol insurance policies are tricky. You want to make sure that you're covered for those, those types of events, uh, which you know they may not be covered. You may have some sort of exclusions in there. Uh, still not, not a justification to go burn other people's stuff, right? Insurance can make you financially whole, maybe, but it's going to wreck your business, right? What are you going to do for those several months when your store is not functioning because it's been burnt down to the ground, right? You're going to lose your customers. You're going to lose all your marketing momentum, probably going to lose your employees. They're going to find different jobs and your insurance company is not going to be able to compensate you and give you back a year of time while they rebuild your store and you rebuild your business. It's, it's too late. It's already ruined. So if these insurance or if these protesters are using that as an excuse that's uh that is a stretch in my mind out of curiosity if this isn't too big of a question what is the biggest problem and how would you rewrite that to be more accurate uh with roe versus wade well i think the entire roe versus wade issue uh should have been left to congress to decide or to the states or to the to the to the body of our government that actually decides those things those are policy issues and I think that that's where they should be left. I think the Congress and the individual states should be responsible for making those decisions. Uh, the fact that the, the problem with Roe versus Wade, if you read the opinion, and let me give you just a quick crash course on it, is basically what the judge, what the, what the opinion did is they set up these three different categories of sort of acceptable processing of abortions. In the first trimester, you can go get an abortion. In the second trimester, you can get you can get an abortion, but the government can limit certain things. And in the final trimester of abortion, you can get an abortion, but the government can place even more 
restrictions on it. So they created sort of this three tier structure and the court just created this a thing out of thin air. They just said, oh, abortion's an issue. We, we think it's a fundamental right, but we also recognize that there should be restrictions on it. So they just created basically this, this law and they created even the own structure of the law. So like that is something that Congress would pass right? They, they pass these bills for the Affordable Care Act and for, you know, the tax laws, the things that impact how we live our lives are passed in Congress. It's just for the, the, the judiciary to decide whether they're constitutional or not. So what happened with Roe is that they created their own structure, their own basically rule of law. They took that away from Congress. And I think that is where the problem is. Again, I'm not making a commentary on the result, but I'm just saying that the way they came to the conclusion is poor. And that's why it's not super precedent in my mind. Nobody voted for these judges making laws directly affecting our lives so much for, quote, democracy. That's from End the Reds. We should be able to sue the police for not doing their jobs. At least we get taxes back. Eric Twog. It is interesting that the gap in the photos exists right at that moment. Yeah, there is an interesting gap in that Matthew Doloff case. And I'm wondering where those photos went. That does seem pretty legislative for the judicial branch. Yeah. Roe versus Wade is the largest mass genocide in human history. Even if Roe were overturned, it'd just go back to the individual states and what liberal state is going to outlaw abortion. And it's easy to drive through to another state. Yeah. Benny Tuto says, I sell insurance. It is covered if you have it. Also interesting bit of info. If DT labels BLM and Antifa as terrorists, it might mean it is not covered without an endorsement. Could be a problem. That's a great that's great feedback on that. Yeah, I'm not an insurance agent, so I don't know how that works. Um, we have we have, you know, a person who does that for us, but but that's really good to know. Yeah. So if they are labeled as terrorists, your your insurance policy may not protect against terrorism. You may need to want to go boost that sucker up. And if you need insurance, just contact Benny Tutos. He'd be happy to sell it to you. All right, let's see. Any other comments? All right. How about this? Is there anything else that, that you want to see? Anything else to cover? Anything else anybody wants to see covered? Uh, because we are we are going to be wrapping up with the hearings from the from uh, Amy Coney Barrett, which is great, which means our schedule is going to open up a little bit. I'm not going to have to listen to eight hours of hearing anymore. Uh, I want to see any other cases that you may want to uh, dive in on a little bit further. Be happy to do that. Uh, Ed GG says, thank you for the show. I love it. If I may advise something, what do you think about splitting the time for questions into smaller sections? Yeah, so this is great. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to... Uh, I'd love to sort of flesh that out a little bit. So do you think that it would make more sense, maybe maybe not for these confirmation hearings, but when we do the uh, sort of the case review, so when we start talking about Rittenhouse, would it, would it make more sense if I broke these up into sort of segments and then did questions? So in other words, it would be a segment, you know, cover a case, cover Rittenhouse, for example, then do some live chat, then do cover another case like uh, Matthew Doloff and then do some live chat. Would that format work better? Or should I save them at the end or should I only take questions? I'm open to suggestions on it because I'm still trying to, to figure out what a good rhythm is. Because I do feel like a lot of the time what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll cover something that people want to talk about, but then I just move on by it and that's way up in the chat and I never get to address those questions. Okay, so Gigi says... Uh, yeah, he'd like that, but I'd, but I'd make a YouTube poll. Yeah, I can do that. All right. Uh, why can't the Dems just stop beating a dead horse? Somebody says. Elias Diaz says, love the channel. Thanks, Elias. El Elias, appreciate you being here. Thoughts on Christopher Caldwell's new book. I have not heard it. I've not heard about this or read it. I will look that up. A poll could work, somebody says. That makes sense. I would prefer what is done currently, somebody says. That's from uh, Carl Silly Toe. Uh, Justice for Juicy Smollett is back. He says, you could also try to tell people to hold questions till the end of the stream so that they can be answered. All right. Kidnapping plot against the Michigan governor. Yeah, I will cover that one. That is a good one. All right. Well, I've got some stuff to think about. I really appreciate that. Thank you, everybody. All right. Well, let's wrap it up for the day. I want to thank you so much for being here. And 
we will be back here tomorrow at the exact same time. 4 p.m. Arizona time, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to hopefully be done with the Amy Coney Barrett hearings tomorrow. We're going to see what happens tomorrow morning, but there's a lot of other stuff, a lot of other good stuff going on that we want to cover. So we want to make sure that you're here for that. Um, as a quick plug, as always, if you know anybody who's been charged with a crime in the state of Arizona, that's what my team and I do. We help people get through the criminal justice system, get their lives back on track, and make sure that these criminal cases are not ruining their futures forever. And we want to make sure that uh, they've got good people to help them with that. And that's what we do. So I want to thank you all once again for being here. Have an amazing night.